Tonight, we pull the spotlight on a man who is seen as a possible upset in the 2023 presidential race. And we'll also dissect the advisory of the Council of State on the Naira policy of the CBN. What would President Muhammad Buhari do now? Find out because the 2023 verdict begins now. And here are the top stories. The Council of State today asked the federal government to print more money or allow co-circulation of the old and the new notes. And the PDP has expelled former Enugu State Governor and uh, Senator, Senator Chimaroke in Namani and some others from Ekiti State from the party. Tonight, we get up close and direct with the candidate of the NNPP, Senator Robio Bosukwankonso. Hello everyone, welcome. It's time for your biggest stories in the land as we push further into the very last two weeks of the election. Gradually, we are moving very close. This is 2023 verdict live on China's television. I'm sure Kimbaloe in Abuja. Our countdown continues everyone. And keep your eyes on this clock. It is 14 days, 12 hours, 57 minutes, and the seconds are counting down. And as much as we are in this program, by the time we're done, this will have decreased. And we'll be looking to get another bright new day. And we move closer. Two weeks, by two, uh, this time, next two weeks, we will be looking forward to the few hours to the election. Nigerians anticipate it. If you've gotten your PVC, now is the opportunity for you to make your voice loud and clear about the choice that you have on your mind for Nigeria's president or the members of the National Assembly. So make it count. So we keep our eyes across the country on what is happening and bringing you up to date with some of the stories that you need to know. Because right now, we're bringing you your election update stories. Presidential candidate of the Accord Party, Professor Christopher Imomolen, is calling on the federal government to address the lingering issues of Naira and fuel scarcity across the nation, as this may threaten the conduct of the 2023 general election. The Accord Party flag bearer told journalists that the lingering issues may escalate into a major crisis if not properly addressed. We call on the federal government to stand up and ensure that this situation is looked into. Senator Emmanuel Boache has won the APC governorship primary rerun. Senator Boache polled 778 votes to defeat Senator Yusuf Yusuf, who polled five votes out of the 796 accredited delegates. Before the primary, five aggrieved governorship aspirants of the All Progressives Congress in Taraba State have vowed not to participate in the primary election scheduled for the 10th of February 2023 in Jalingo, the Taraba State capital. Addressing the news conference in Abuja, spokesperson of the aggrieved aspirants, Senator Yusuf Abubakar, says the rescheduled primary election is a clear violation of the judgment of the Supreme Court, which voided the election that produced Mr. Emmanuel Bacha as a governorship candidate of the party. The Court of Appeals sitting in Kanu has validated Wali Mohammed Sadiq as the substantive PDP governorship candidate in Kanu State. Delivering the judgment, Justice Usman Musale notes that Mr. Abacha had no local standing to defy the primary election that produced Amin Wali as candidate. The campaign train of the governorship candidate of the African Democratic Party in Ogun State, Mr. Olubi Tegbeye, made a stop at Afon, local government area of Ogun State, where he urged the electorates to vote for the ADC in the March governorship election. Addressing the gathering at the rally, Mr. Otegbeye promises his supporters that his administration will ensure inclusivity if voted as governor of the state. 
Governor Joy Ediri of Bayelsa State and the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Yakubu Dugara, have asked the people of Southern Kaduna to vote out the All Progressives Congress, especially in the state. The party leaders stated this at a rally organized by the party in Zonkwa, Zagon Katef local government area of Kaduna State. The Bayelsa State Governor accused the APC of using religion and ethnicity to cause disunity amongst Nigerians and therefore urges them to vote for the party's candidate at the federal and state level. A civil society organization, Yaga Africa, is asking the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to address the challenges experienced during last Saturday's mock accreditation exercise. A board member of the organization, Mr. Ezenwa Nwago, made the observation during the presentation of Yaga's findings during the exercise in Abuja. The challenges identified faulty beavers machines, poor internet connection, difficulty in identifying biometrics like fingerprints, and some centers did not get the machine at all. Candidates vying for positions in the forthcoming general elections have been warned against utterances and actions capable of creating disturbances in society. The Commission of Police Edo State and the resident electoral commissioner INEC in Edo State highlighted these points during a peace accord signing ceremony in Benin City, the Edo State capital, where representatives of political parties who signed the document welcomed the ritual as relevant in upholding in peace in the state before, during and after the elections. Thank you so much. There you have it. You've, uh, you're now up to date with some of the top stories across the nation. Now, let's focus on our major conversation for tonight. And this is the state of the race. Council of State has faulted the implementation of the Naira redesigned policy, uh, though members accepted the policy today at the meeting which held at the presidential villa. The council also advised the president to print more money or allow old and new currency to run concurrently to ease attention. The briefing said House correspondents have the council meeting, the chair, on the meeting chaired by the president, the attorney general of the federation, Mr. Abubakar Malami, stated that the council illuminated the need for aggressive action by the CBN to ensure adequate supply of the Naira and the system for proper implementation of the policy. The Minister of Justice and the Governor of Taraba State spoke to the journalists after the meeting. critical issues of interest with particular regard to the election and Naira perhaps redesign, the Council of State meeting was summoned by the President and arising from it, elaborate deliberations and discussions were held among the members of the Council of State. Basically what took more time was that of the monetary issue because of the hardship of money in circulation across the whole state. But generally the views across board is that principally the policy is accepted. Just like any new policy or any new change, at the beginning people resist it, even though it's good. But generally it's accepted. But the major issue across board from all the states and most of the speakers is that of implementation. And so many views were preferred, particularly that the CBN governor should look into making sure that money is available, the new money is available in quantum. And there were suggestions too that if the new money is not in a circulation or printing them could be difficult, the old money that hasn't been changed could be recirculated and pumped into circulation 
to ease the tension, particularly for the poor people in our society who just need a little sum of money to buy their food, buy their drugs for daily basis. <laughs> So there you have it, some of the sound bites coming uh, out of the Council of State meeting earlier today. The Council of State meeting is comprised of uh, former heads of state, uh, very top government officials and uh, representatives and leaders of the other arms of government like the National Assembly and the Judiciary. So you can see former uh, heads of government and former presidents of the Federation uh, who attended that meeting today. So it means that it's a big deal. Whatever the Council of State made, it's a big deal. It's no small. They don't go and discuss frivolous issues. Uh, these are the kind of issues that is brought before, before them. Issues that are touching on the very nerve and the very uh, uh, core of the nation. Now. Let's get some political and economic implications of all of this because this has uh, a far-reaching implication. Don't forget, the World Bank and the IMF are already speaking about some of these policies and warning Nigeria about this and what could be the implications. I'm being joined tonight on the program by uh, a very, very notable economics in Ni economist in Nigeria and the CEO of Financial Derivatives, Mr. Bismarck Rewani joins us virtually from Lagos. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. B uh, Rewani, for joining us tonight. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, you. You don't look like uh, you are in short supply of uh, the new notes. <laughs> I, was, I was in short supply of the old notes, and also, I'm also in short supply of the new notes, so I had nothing to change in the first place. <laughs> All right. I mean, if this affects you, uh, it's, I, I can imagine what a lot of people are going through. But give us a sense of what you think is going on. Um, let's, let's take the conversation from what the Council of State meeting, the outcome of that meeting today. They made a suggestion. The summary of the suggestion is, look, print more money or, and allow more of, I mean, the, 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 the two notes to concurrently uh, flow in the, the system. What do you make of that kind of advisory? Don't forget, the Council of State are in the advisory capacity to the president. Thank you. I think first, first and foremost, we need to step back because this is bi-dimensional. There's the political angle and there's the economic angle. I would like to share the thoughts of what the political, what the economic consequences of this uh, actual policy is. So we start by saying, what were the objectives of the policy in the first place? The objectives were actually in all fivefold. One, to curb inflation. Two, to reduce terrorism. Three, to reduce counterfeiting. Four, so tangentially to stop vote buying. And five, to increase financial inclusion. Now, at the beginning of this policy, uh, we had written out a note. That's the slide you see there. Those are the clear five objectives. At the beginning, said, set up there is the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions don't get you there. So the pro program was congested. But anyway, <clears throat> yeah, that's we are where we are. Now, we have what they call the rule of unintended consequences. Let us break it down and see exactly what this means. Total money supply, which is not cash, is 52 trillion naira. Sorry, Mr. Rewani. Before you move to the next point, so let's get it clear. I mean, you know, when I'm in uh, 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 trouble with um, uh, economics, uh, that, that's where I, I run to you. So for Nigerians and my viewers tonight who are watching, you say this policy in itself is not a bad policy. Uh, implementation from your standpoint is a problem, is it? Uh, well, the congestion of the program itself has been a problem. So. But we are where we are, because we'll come back to the political dimension. So you can't take it in isolation. So that's why I stated first the, in, the intentions, the programs and so are good. But could you have done it? Could you have started earlier, knowing that you had elections coming? Could you have actually made it flexible? Yes, I think we tried that. But the central bank is a central bank, and the Mint is a company that prints money on behalf of the central bank. So that's a different, and it's a security printing process. And the law is quite clear. The Central Bank of Nigeria, under the, with the permission of the president, can decide in the best interest of the nation to do this. 
And that's why I stated the five intentions very clear. Now, next slide is the rule of unintended consequences. Let us see exactly what the impact of this is. And I say this clearly that the total money supply in Nigeria, and don't forget, I said all, all, cash, all cash is money, but not all money is cash. So you can see there that money supply is 52 trillion naira, but the cash in circulation is 3 trillion naira. One of the problems was that people said people were keeping cash under their, under their mattress, under their pillow, and all that. In any case, the cash, like, where I want to keep my cash, where I want to keep it, you can't tell me how to keep it. So, but the interesting thing is that from the estimates we've seen, and these are just estimates, that three of the eight denominations constitute about almost 2.7 trillion. In other words, about 77% of the total cash in circulation are made up of 500, so 200, 500 and 1,000 notes. And the rest of the denominations, which are five, are from a minuscule part of it, right? So what, what, what do we have? But the most important thing is that Confidence. This 2.7 or whatever trillion you have is money that people keep and people pay to the bank. So on a given day, people are paying money to the bank and people are withdrawing money. But when there's a crisis of confidence, when people withdraw money, nobody, not, no money goes back into the banking system. So the, the, the banks are dry. The only, the only one must apply cash for them, central bank. People who have lost confidence in cash have taken the, the money out. So exactly what you wanted to avoid is what you are getting. If anybody who has money now is keeping it, I'd rather have a rat eat it because it's taking a long time. Or an umbrella come, the probability of an umbrella coming when he knows I have no cash is low. But if I pay the money into a bank and I don't get it out, the money is trapped. That is where the crisis of competence comes. And if you look at it, it is actually, I've talked about the three to eight denomination. And now let us see. Another thing that we must know is that 39% of Nigerians are entrepreneurs, directly or indirectly. And 16% of all activity in this country is wholesale and retail trade. If you take the assumption that, it, that all, almost all trades in the markets and the informal markets are settled by cash and only marginally by POS, you'll find that the velocity of circulation of money, which is very important, is 16 times. 16 times means that a trader turns around our money maybe one and a half times a month. But if you take it as a percentage of trading activity alone, the velocity of circulation is 29 times. This is very complicated. But what it does mean is that three times in a month, a woman who is selling rice or gari and all of that, turns her money, sells, and takes the money to buy back. If the cash is trapped, then you have, you have actually stopped her from earning money. But that's, that's interesting, but that's not the whole case. Now, if you know, if you go to the next slide, where we say, uh, back to the cave of fast forward to the future. The consequences today are that, and I, I checked this out in the market, for a bag of rice today, we have, if you buy an old notes, you ask you to bring 42,000. If you buy a new notes, you pay 40,000. If you buy by transfer to the account, you pay 41,000. Some have no money, so they pay by credit. If you are taking credit, it's 45,000. So you have multiple pricing, which has serious implications, right? Then we call what we call disruption downtime. And you'll see that slide in a minute. It tells you that the average number of people in front of an ATM before now, this is a multiple pricing we're talking about, about old notes, new notes, transfer and credit. The more distorted pricing is, the more it dislocates the allocation of resources, which is not good. Now, the other thing is the downtime due to queues in the petrol station and queues at the ATM. Before now, the average number of people in front of an ATM in the Koei, Victoria and, and, and Lekki were three to four people. In Midtown Lagos, Midtown Lagos, which is the equipment center, there were eight people, equipment and Yaba, in front of the ATM at average times. And in Uptown, which is Alimosho, you had about 15 people. So the downtime was five minutes to get your money out of the ATM if you're in Ikoi, seven minutes if you're in a good meter, and 10 minutes if you're in a limosha. Now, fast forward to now, what are we seeing? Downtime, for the average number of people in front of an ATM in Ikoi and Victoria Line are now 40. Now you can see that 40 people. In, in, in Midtown, in a good meter, it's about 100 people. And in a limosha, 
It's about 600 people. So there's mayhem and chaos out there. So what are we seeing? Consequences are that flower sales in Lagos, flour is down 30%. The rams in Kano are down 70%. And cement in Kogi State is down 40% of sales. So that is what we see. That is the economic dimension. And the impact at the end of the day is that it will affect GDP this quarter conservatively, right, by 3%. And by aggressively, it could reduce GDP in this quarter by 5%. Nothing is done in a hurry. Now, but the big problem is that when there's a crisis of confidence, the confidence and the credibility of the, the, government, the government cannot be tested. The consequence of a loss of confidence in government policy is a very, very tricky thing. So I want you to imagine that if a school announces that your children should come back on the 1st of January, and then your child leaves worry and goes all the way to Enugu, only to find out they say, no, no, we postponed the date of, of um, to the 10th of January, he comes back. The third time they call you, you say, look, find out when the school is open and I'll send my child. I'm not going to send my child up and down. Now, if the government shifts ground on this deadline, it will do so much damage to its credibility as a governing body. So what the answer is this. One, increase supply if you can, if you have to import the currency notes and all that, so that one, people stop suffering. Two, that credibility of government is not eroded, which is already then dead. And three, people will now start bringing money back into the banking system. Even if you bring print seven trillion today and there's no credibility, all the money will stay under mattresses. And the whole role of money as a medium of exchange and money as a legal tender are two different things. The fact that you say it's legal tender doesn't mean that people will accept it in exchange for anything. And these are basic economic rules. And fundamentally, well, we are where we are, and we have to deal with this. That is my explanation of this for all Nigerians today. Well, interesting. The, uh, I, I, try, I would like to take you back just uh, uh, with the eighth and the ninth uh, slides, which uh, for me have tremendous or far-reaching implications on, uh, on the economy. You talked about multiple pricing and the distortions. Uh, the decline in sales reported across the market. For example, the comparison that you made, flour in Lagos, 30% down. Rams in Kano, 70% down. Cement in Kogi, 40% uh, down. These are direct consequences. And you talked about the impact on uh, the, uh, all the aspects of the economy. Now you, you talked about the GDP and uh, the inflation rate. Look at the graph on the ninth uh, slide. And uh, you, you, you're projecting something here. Is there anything that we can do, Mr. Rewani, to wind back the possible consequence so that, I mean, it, this is the economy that is very fragile, Mr. Rewani, isn't it? Yes. First of all, you can't make omelette without breaking eggs. So we are where we are. Even if we, we cannot wind that back, all you have to do is to absorb it. Because a, a contraction in GDP means laying off people and all that. Thank God it hasn't lasted for too long. Thank God the elections are only 16 days away. Between now and then, maybe they would have put enough money into the system and it would not, it would not damage the economy. Neither would it damage the credibility of governance in the country, which is important. When governments make pronouncements and give deadlines, they must be obeyed. And that is the important thing. The moment you have a situation where you cannot be obeyed all, you keep on changing it frequently. What you will have is anarchy because nobody will believe you anymore you know and you say this is a currency and this is a... look the currency of a country is, is is so so crucial and critical and therefore must be respected so you made a, a, an example of not too far away country from ours here yeah? that's kenya uh, you call them the golden yes. boy of cashless economy uh, what are they doing right that we are not doing well, first and foremost, they are consistent. Secondly, they do the right thing at the right time rather than doing the wrong thing at the right time. Thirdly, institutions in Kenya are very strong and robust. Therefore, if Kenya makes an announcement, it go through. The, the presidential candidate, Ruto, said, I will remove subsidy on day one when I get there. And on day one, he did it. So, but 
the, the commodity that is in shortest supply in this country today is truth and honesty. So people come out to say exactly what they know is incorrect and false. And tomorrow they come back and say they change their mind. So as long as you have a culture where it, it's not shameful to, to, to make public pronouncements which are false, then the consequences of it is this. But over time, over time, I think that we will begin to see an improvement because there are consequences of this. Direct consequences and indirect consequences and unintended consequences. So, uh, Mr. Rewanin, uh, I'm a layman and I would like to put it this way. Uh, if I have learned well from your explanation today, that we as a people have brought upon ourselves um, a disaster that, that naturally was sitting on its own and we just drew it out of the bed and it's a boom, it's in our faces, isn't it? I mean, we could have done this at another time. Is that possible? Yeah, I mean, but you see, hindsight is 2020 vision. We can talk from now to tomorrow. It doesn't change. We are on the ground. What we need to do is to do damage control. Damage control means that two aspects. Print more money, get the mint or whatever it is overseas to give us all of this supply. We store confidence because if we keep on moving deadlines, the day you say, you know, you cry woof, 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 the day when something happens, nobody comes out. So it is important. Let us not underestimate the importance of having discipline in government, right? And, you know, we can blame ourselves from now to tomorrow. That's what we call unforced errors. But for Nigeria, this is, and I, I say categorically, this is set point, match point, so set point, break point, match point, champion, championship point. If you, if you get it wrong now, it's over. Uh, and I'm going to ask you a very tough question, Mr. Rewani, because I am a proponent of name to shame, right? If, and governance is about the, the, the direct uh, import of the, of the policy of anybody in leadership or governance is on the average person. Um, the CBN governor, is the man getting it right or wrong? If you were the president today, would you keep him? What do you think you will fix, especially at that Apex Bank, which has the lock and the keys to the livelihood of the Nigerian people? I don't think blaming anybody would solve any problem right now. It's, it is, uh, you know, it's an exercise in futility. And you can, you can claim that, you can blame A, blame B, blame, blame C. The point is that we, the people in this country today, are under pressure. The government and the policymakers are under pressure as, as to their credibility. Let's fix that rather than blaming people. That's, if not, it becomes a lynch mob. About that's me, me, Ms. That Arwani, we, sorry, Ms. Arwani, where then do we go from here? If you don't know where our wrong is, then how do we correct it? That's the point. Okay. If someone is not yeah. delivering to the needs and the yearnings of the people, should we keep the person on and on in office? That's the question I'm asking. We need to find out what the problem is. How do we then solve it? Well, the last time I checked, the governor sent a report to the president. The president has that responsibility. There are 18 new candidates, and there's one president right now. Let him. He will, I'm sure the president is quite capable of doing his job, and he will decide when he wants to keep people or when he wants to, um, uh, you know, rusticate them or for one or word, uh, amputate them. So uh, for now, it doesn't make any, what we should be concentrating on is how we can get people to stop suffering and how we can get uh, confidence back so that when the government says a deadline, the deadline is obeyed. If you don't resolve these two things, then you have another thing coming. So um, we are in an ele election period and I would like to ask you as much as I know, that you're not a politician, you are, you're a professional in the economic circle. Uh, but what implication, direct or indirect, do you think this could have on our election? Well, I'm not sure that it will have any direct impact on the elections. The only thing is that in this quarter, the same institution that is handling currency is also handling the movement of election material. And in, an, in another month from now, you will also be dealing with census. And, in our note that we sent out in late November, I warned that that even an efficient government will have 
who suffer from policy indigestion. Now it has come to pass. The indigestion has come out and the country is now constipated. So what we should be looking for is a laxative to take care of this problem. Now, uh, one thing also that I like to uh, bring to, uh, to the fore now is uh, the concern of the World Bank and the IMF, specifically on this policy. What do you make of the warnings that these uh, two global financial institutions have uh, given in respect of Nigeria's economy? Well, I can understand their position. First of all, Nigeria has very severe multidimensional poverty. We have high unemployment. And therefore, anything that leads to a contraction in, uh, in um, GDP, which will lead to unemployment, is a danger. So we are members of the IMF. We, we contribute our, our, our levies and every, every year. So they are, they are supposed to send, send you warnings and give you advice. And it's up to you. But you see, those things are good and they are useful. So I, as we go along in, into, into this next dispensation, we would know the things to avoid, and especially the timing and uh, having what I call asymmetric information. If you are giving me information to make decisions and you don't give me all of it, and I'm making decisions, then the impact is on everybody. So like I said, you know, truly, the policies themselves are not bad. But if they are misconstrued by the people who are supposed to benefit from it, if they are done with other motives, what, ha what happens at the end of the day is that, remember, you can fool some of the people some of the time, you can fool all of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. That is exactly where we are. That's why I'm saying it is set point, break point, match point, championship point for Nigeria. Get it wrong now, and you are done forever. I'll take you back to this 10th sli slide, Mr. Arowani, uh, which is prompting me to ask this question. Uh, the example of the Kenya as a golden boy of a cashless economy that you gave earlier on. Now, we are in the process of transition. Uh, we're trying to do an election to get a new leader to run this country. Now, it does look to me from what you've uh, said tonight that the next president of Nigeria is going to have his work cut out for him. There's a huge burden. That body now needs to fix the inflation rate, unemployment figures, a whole gamut of issues that he needs to deal with uh, on the first day of assuming office. Looking at the example of Kenya, what advice would you give the next president of this country uh, on the first day of getting into office? Because in the past we've seen uh, those who have criticized a uh, uh, president for not taking quick decision on the issue of economy. Well, to be honest with you, Kenya is the golden boy of Kastia's economy. But let us remember what happened in Kenya. There was an election which led to massive riots and multiple casualties and deaths. And everything was suspended. Then there was another election. In, in both cases, the election was finally decided at the judiciary level. And everybody accepted it because there was no judicial miscarriage or extrajudicial judgments. So if the whole electoral process itself from beginning to end, is filled with benefits, but also risks and landmines. So what happens before election? What happens on the election day? What happens when results are announced? And what happens when, when it is litigated? And so institutional, institutional strength is what saved Kenya. And that's why Kenya is still together as a national entity. But if the institutions of governance in this country and when I say governance, both judicial, um, legislative, and executive, are weak and fragile at the slightest light of a, a match, you have a conflagration. So I, I, Nigerians should read the book by Amishwa Award, which is The World on Fire and the Dark Sides of Democracy. Democracy itself does not mean stability. Stability precedes the democracy. But if you put it the other way around, so what you want to ask yourself, what I'm doing today, am I going towards stability or am I going towards democracy because of the word democracy, right? So some people say democracy means they don't go crazy. So I don't know what that means. But obviously, in this part of the world, I think the most lucrative job should be that of a psychiatrist right now. All right.
So, Mr. Rewaning, uh, let's wrap up on this note. Uh, and my last question for you, and I will go run through slide five, six, and seven so that I can ask those questions. Which, I mean, anytime I'm on, on this program, one thing that comes to my mind is the average Nigerian people who make up the most of the population of our country. Now, if you look at slide five, when you talked about back to the cave or fast forward to the future, the price of the commodity, some of the products that are already expensive, they are now going to buy it even more expensive. Uh, look at slide six, we talked about the downtime and more than what Nigerians can bargain for. And you made an example of a situation in Lagos. What about uh, the interior part of, uh, of uh, Benway State or the interior part of Bauchi or Kebi State or Kwara State? These are um, direct impact. And you look at the issue you raise about the man hours the people have spent and how that will impact on the GDP. You've given an advice to the, pre uh, to the, to the, to the government. I'd like to extract um, an unpaid consultancy for the privilege of our Nigerian people. Uh, government doing their own on one side. What would you advise the Nigerian people to be doing? These are consequences. They need to tighten the, the, their belt, isn't it? But in what areas? How would they go about their lives so that their lives would not be too difficult for them at, at this time? Uh, let me first say that Lagos is a place where the GDP per capita, that's the income per head, is over $8,000, while the average GDP per capita in Nigeria is $2,000. Lagos is elitist, Lagos is sophisticated, and the people here can survive. When you go to certain parts of the country where I come from, in Benin River, right? The people there, you have no money to even go to the ATM to get it. So there's poverty first and cash. The only time they can get cash is either if they rob somebody, mug somebody, or bunker some or, or, or lick some pipe. So it's the fundamental problems of one, slow growth, low cash, and in, inequitable distribution of income, and governance, both at the state and local government level, which are ripping the people off. So we cannot, we cannot litigate the whole problem of Nigeria on one program. But what I want to let you know is that today, the chips are down, do damage control, so that those guys who are in Ogidigme in Wari or Wari local government, or those who are in Karanamoda, who have no money, who can only go to the ATM to use it as a mirror to, to look at their faces rather than draw money, they are in a different category than those who are in Uptown Lagos in Ali Masha who can go and draw their 5,000 and 10,000. That is the truth. You have to deal with your poverty problem, and that is the agenda for whoever, whoever is going to come in mm. as the president on the 25th of um, oh, February. Interesting there. Mr. Bismarck Iwani, thank you so much. Always been a savior when it comes to these very, very difficult economic issues. You always come to my aid. Thank you so much. And actually, for the benefit of uh, the very many millions of Nigerians who are watching tonight, um, it's a case of, they say, the rich also cry. But in this case of our nation, because if someone like you don't even have enough cash to spend, imagine what is happening to just those people who are on the road uh, of this country. It's indeed a very tough period for our people. Thank you so much indeed, Mr. Rowani. Thank you. We'll take a break, everyone. And when we return, I'll be talking to Senator Robert Musa Kwan Kunso. Within the next 60 minutes or so, we will be discussing his plans for Nigeria. He's been touted to be a disruptor. How much of that disruption? Is it taking this disruption for victory or this disruption for the disrupting sake? Congressor will be joining me after now. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Let's turn our attention now to the presidential race. Well, I told you about how they describe him now as a disruptor to the race. It's usually a two-horse race that we excuse me, we find in our electoral cycle. But this time around, it's so much different. Uh, he's someone who has had his eyes on being Nigeria's president and he's not backing down. A two-term governor of Kano State, a former minister of defense, he's called a PhD, and sometimes uh, he needs to remind people to know uh, just how much he's tried to educate himself. He's a presidential candidate of the NNPP, Senator Robbie Musa Kwonkonso joins us live here in our election studio. Thank you so much 
Thank and welcome you, to our studio. Thank your you first time, much. isn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, uh, before we get into uh, the, <laughs> the old matters, um, two weeks before the election, it looks like um, a dream, right? <laughs> We've been counting down, and it's just two weeks, 14 days. How does it feel with you? Well, thank you very much, uh, Shion. Let me say that uh, politics is our game. I have been in it for the last uh, 30 years. 30 years this time, I was Deputy Speaker of the House of Reps. I was in the Constitutional Conference of 1992, uh, 94, 95, and so on and so forth. And uh, I contested election 18 times. I won 15. I lost three. One as a sitting governor in 2003 in Kano, one in Lagos, uh, primary, presidential primaries in APC, and of course the third one was in uh, uh, Patakot. So um, we are used to it, and uh, this is our life. We'll continue as long as uh, we're alive. Uh, mm. We have to do whatever it takes in this game to save this country. So it's for me... Uh, it's like all other days, every day I've been working in the last 30 years. Mm. No Sunday, no Monday, no Friday, <laughs> no Christmas, no Salah. Every day we have a program mm. to suit that day uh, of the year. Mm. And uh, we are so happy about it. And uh, when we uh, be looking forward to see just how many of the red hat wearing supporters of yours, the, the Kwankwansia and the Talakawas that are are always um, following you, how much of those will be able to turn out. Uh, you've lost a uh, very remarkable uh, or very interesting way that you have lost in three major cities of Nigeria, in Kano, Lagos, and Potakot. And these are cities that hold very big elections in Nigeria and hoping on how you can turn that around in the next two weeks. Uh, but for you, if you look at it, um, does the race look clear that you, you can get it? Of course, you see, um, one year ago, there was close to nothing in the NNPP. But when we joined it, before you know it, millions of people registered in the party. And of course, we are the first party to submit our registered voters, both soft and hard copies, to the INEC. And before you know it, we are able to put our structure in all the wards in this country, in all the local governments, in all the states and zones, the six zones that we have, and of course, at national level. Not only that, we are able to have close to 100% uh, uh, candidates, ranging from the uh, presidential candidate, which is my humble self, and of course, my vice president, uh, Dr. Isaac Edahosa or Bishop Isaac Edahosa. And of course, uh, we were able to get credible candidates across the board. Uh, today, as it stands, we have 108 out of 109 senators. We have 28 out of 28 uh, uh, governors. And of course, we have uh, members of the House of Reps and members of the State Assembly uh, across the, the, the country. And uh, as it stands today, we uploaded 100% of our uh, uh, agents, polling agents, 100% in all the polling booths that we have uh, in this country. So you're a force in this race? Oh, <laughs> very strong force. They call when it the first force. That sometimes you are being referred to as a disruptor. Why do you think people feel or see you as such, as a disruptor of the race? You see, before now, we had two parties, to the extent that the leaders in those two parties were so arrogant that there are two doors in this country. If you want to get out of the place, meaning join the politics, it's either you take this one or you take the other one. And it's like they frustrated everybody, everybody who was credible, people's capacity and so on, was frustrated, leaving only some of them there. And when we brought this party, of course they underrated us, which, and we were very happy about it, to the extent that uh, they thought uh, just like any other party that came and died along the road. Now we, have, we are two weeks now to uh, the election, and fortunately for Nigerians, 
the NNPP is getting even stronger by the day. Even though we have people across uh, the parties, people who are sponsoring all sorts of fake uh, 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 opinion polls, opinion polls in the air, you know, uh, using phone calls, few thousands, and they write the result and say this is number one. Bloomberg, this is number Bloomberg two. Rep uh, poll is the latest, which came out yesterday or today, and is uh, putting your very good friend Peter Obi Absolutely. in the lead. Right, let me tell you, what they are doing is very dangerous to this country. Why and I so? want the security agencies, the federal government, and all those concerned to take note of it. Now look, when uh, Muhammad Buhari started in 2003, in northern Nigeria, everybody was going to vote for Buhari, especially in 2002, to the extent that I lost my seat, mainly because of that wind. And people voting in Kano would think that everybody in this country was voting for uh, Muhammad Buhari. At the end of the day, of course, you are just talking about your own uh, area. And when somebody was announced, those people will only go out on the streets burning tires and killing people and destroying properties because they thought everybody in the country was voting for Muhammad Buhari. And so many people, things happened in northern Nigeria, especially in, the, in my zone, in the northwest. Now, a similar scenario is trying, is to, trying to rear its head again. Now that uh, people are bringing fake figures, believing that this is number one, this is number two, this is number three, and this is number four. And in our opinion, that paper should be put upside down. That's the fact of the matter. Upside that down, so how will it Number read four they are putting should be number one. Who, who is number four? That's Rabi Konkoso, the NNPP. We are the people on the ground. PDP and APC are crumbling. So many issues there, and we all know about it. And people are looking for an alternative in this country. And we are taking that advantage. Now, when the number one, as they call it now, uh, uh, came, there was this uh, social media hype. Everybody, people voting from Australia, from New Zealand, from America and Britain, people who, who some of them have never been to Nigeria. Maybe their origin is, is this country. So now the dust is settling, but still people are sponsoring this sort of uh, 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 poll. Now, you see, the opinion of many people who rely on that fake uh, 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 poll is that this one has won. And anything to the contrary, it will be like what happened, what has been happening in northern Nigeria. But, 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 we know, uh, we know, I know. Mm -hmm. You see, we are the people on the ground. We are the one. I visited well over 400 local governments today in this country. And we are still visiting more and more uh, 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 local governments. Even today, I'm just coming back uh, uh, from uh, uh, Edo State. Now, the reality is, if things are allowed to go the way they are going, I foresee a real crisis at the end of the day. So you are so, suggesting that the polling should be stopped? No, it should not be stopped, but it should be realistic. People should not be allowed to be telling lies. But this organization Look, say me, that this is what they found out on the field. That's what they are saying. You see, everything is getting so bad in this country. People ordinarily who would be respected, the ones we see, and even those who are sponsoring it ordinarily should be respected. But unfortunately, we are having virus now. Everything is going bad. To the extent that this is a booby trap. Somebody is putting traps. Now you say it's number one, number two. You give him this percentage. Other people have small, small percentage. It's a trap. And this is very, very dangerous. I have seen it. What, is the, what danger do you think you The protect? danger is we believe that these guys are in the air. And somebody is saying they are on the ground. And one result comes, and the reality comes that they are in the air. Hmm. And people start fighting, those who believe in that. Uh, Which particular candidate are you making reference to? Of now? course, the one they always portray as number one, that's the Labour uh, candidate. You don't think that it deserves or is capable no, of those figures? Absolutely wrong thing and very dangerous for the country. And I want the security agencies and even the presidency to take note of what I'm saying. Look, even though I'm in the race, but I have been in this part, in, in, in party politics for a very long time. Mm. And we believe in this country. And we must not allow people to bring in fake news, to bring things that we are sure, just like we have seen with Muhammad Buhari, 
I was in PDP. Most of the time he was contesting, except when we were together in APC. Many houses were, I was even attacked in Kano when I was in PDP supporting another candidate because everybody was believing that uh, the whole world, the everybody in Nigeria was voting for Muhammadu Buhari, not knowing that he's only in your local government and in your state. So I think we should take note of that. And even the media itself, I believe, is ganging up to support what we are seeing, uh, uh, which we believe will not help this country. Now, so you, you must have a very strong reason why you think some of these poll and these different organization, not one, not two, who have polled, and uh, your friend Peter Obi has been put in the lead. Other political parties uh, like PDP and APC, they also have poll that are in their favor. Why? Is it because it's not in your favor that you think these are not correct? Or you think that these polls should not be allowed to be made public? Now, did you see any poll from northern Nigeria? In fact, all those polls were coming from the south. And the media that is, that is propagating that fake information is mainly from that part of the country. And what we are saying is, you see, things have gone so bad. Where are the good people? Where are the people who are supposed to be leaders in all these areas? That's what I'm telling you, that things are getting so bad almost everywhere. And unless we come to reality, well, for me, I mean, people are just planting things that will only explode. Well, I mean, is it because this is not in your favor? If it were no, I'm you... telling you the reasons. If you go to the... See, and these things are on telephone. Over 90% of my supporters don't even know Twitter. They don't even know social media. If you want to meet them, go to Musa Market. Go to Market in Kanu. Go to even Market in Sabo Ibadan. Go to Market in, uh, in, in Rivers. Go to Roads and so on and ask people. You cannot just go rely and take very small sample. If you are talking of over 200 million people, you just take a couple of thousands and say this is the opinion of Nigerians. Look, this was being sponsored mainly to get donations. Because now the impression they are given is all of us are not even the rest. The winner is already being predicted. And this is very dangerous. You see, get money, put these traps on the ground, and create problems. When the election is announced, I know that, look, anybody, even me, if my party is based on religion or based on ethnicity, even before the 25th election of uh, 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 February, that party has lost the election. Mm. And you see, uh, I mean, people have to come out and do something. The sort of problems we are having today, ranging from uh, scarcity of oil to scarcity of cash and so on and so forth, these were things that were manufactured, not necessarily today. We are just reaping what some people have already planted uh, in the past. Senator. Uh, these, some of these polls are, in fact, done by Bloomberg, for example, that released the poll yesterday or today, uh, is a foreign organization. You see, so, uh, so, uh, you know, this is what I'm asking. I have, been, I have been in the UK for about 10 years of my life, mm. and you get crooks in the, in the UK. You get crooks in Europe. You get to what end do you think, I mean, if you are alleging that there are motives that are untoward, in uh, the release and the conduct of this poll, what, to what intent do you think that these, uh, these people or this organization have about the Nigerian One, create politics? crisis when an election is announced. Two, the candidate now will be getting donations left, right, and center from international communities to their supporters all over the world because it's number one. So you see all these things, as I told you, things are falling apart. Even those that ordinarily you should trust. It's just like you now, have, having known something on the ground, now you go out what is happening in this studio. You are here. You are witness to what is happening. And somebody outside there is telling another story. What about Where the one that favored Tinubu and Atiku? I've not seen that one. I've not seen that one. So, I mean, you are criticizing the poll by, uh, that favors Peter Obi. All of them favored him, but, so far, the ones I saw. So you don't think Peter Obi has a chance in Look, this election? ask all these parties are doing their in-house. We even do our in-house polls. And I can tell you, none of them, they want to be fair. 
and they are not bringing it. Why is APC doing its own? Why is PDP not doing its own? When they do it, they know the winner. That's the, that's the whole thing. They know the story. Many of them now are rattled. They mm. cannot bring you, what they, if, what they if have If you done. think, Senator, that the poll does not reflect what is going on the ground as it favors Peter Obi in most of the polls that have been released, what do you think about Peter Obi's chances? You see, I can tell you, and I said it here on this chair, when we are about to come together, and I said it, that the only opportunity they had is for us to come together. Now we know what is happening. The last, uh, the first one they released from his side, from Peter Obi's side, they are giving me 6% in the Northwest. Even a madman, madman, knows that I'm over and above 6% or even 60%. They have done it. We have seen the in-house uh, figures of PDP and APC. And they dare not bring it out. And you see, I always enjoy people who would want to underrate me. They have done that in 1999. Nobody was giving me a chance in Kano. Within a few months, the party came. I went into primary and PDP. I cleared it 100%. So also the, the general election. So you and repeat the same? It's the same. You think you that's can win the, this that's election? That's what is on the ground now. You think you can win this election? Of course. Of course. You see, as far as we are concerned in the NPP, we have locked Northern Nigeria. In fact, even today, when I had a call from this, uh, from you or the, 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 these uh, uh, channels, I was there the youth wing of Khan in northern Nigeria, all of them came together and endorsed Rabi Kokoso, which was very good for them, for northern Nigeria, and by extension, Nigeria itself. And so many other groups have done it. We don't want to go to the market and start shouting. But I can tell you, many people will be shocked. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody wants to do uh, a poll, even you can do it. Tomorrow, go and put your cap and go to any market in Abuja or go to market in a village, they will tell you who they support. But if you do a telephone thing, telephone Android, yeah. now why are my supporters? Well over 90% if you tell them uh, 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 Twitter, they'll just look at you, social media. Let me get your view on the decision of the Council of State today. They made, uh, in summary, they said, look, uh, print more money or, um, uh, or print more money, or um, c allow the uh, the two nodes to run concurrently. Yes. <clears throat> you see, um, let me congratulate those who were expelled from PDP and uh, tell them that we'll be very happy to have them. In any case, all of them, including Chimaroke Namani was my colleague in 1999 as governor. And we foresaw all these things coming. So um, we are happy with what is happening in the PDP and the APC. And I'm sure in the next uh, two, two weeks or so, more will come. Now, on the issue of the Council of State, uh, the issue of printing more money or allowing the two nodes to run concurrently, you see, I think the whole thing was a mistake. The policy. The policy. The swapping of the yes, national. especially the timing. Everything has time. It's just like here in the north now. If you go and start planting crops, you hardly get them because this is not the time. But very soon time will come. When it comes, even if you throw it out of the window, you will see it germinating and coming out for everybody to see. So uh, we did not support the idea of this uh, uh, currency uh, 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 redesign uh, at this critical time because you see this is the time that we need peace this is the time that we need uh, uh, prosperity so that people can be happy so that they can go comfortably and vote the people of their choice now look at the situation now fuel almost nothing you go to everywhere i went to many states in uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks and just there is no this fuel. And where they are, the price is multiplying by two or even more. So uh, 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 plus this issue of no cash. You see, if you are bringing this type of policy, you have to do a lot of groundwork. We started e-payment in Kano. 
when we wanted to start it, we went around and looked at the issue of banking facilities in towns, villages, and cities in Kano State. And we realized we could not start unless we have additional banks. We registered 37 microfinance banks in Kano just to prepare for e-payment uh, in Kano State. And government, any government must do that because the idea is not to punish the people. The idea is to ensure that uh, right thing is done. So we support cashless uh, 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 transaction. But the way it is being done, government is only punishing mm -hmm. the innocent people uh, in the country. And I'll ask you some very straightforward question. If you win uh, the election, um, you will have on your hands, if you elected the next president, a lot of issues to resolve in the, uh, in the economy of the, of the country. Uh, the debt burden is going to be dead, inflation figures, unemployment. I mean, on your fourth year of assuming office, should you be elected, what drastic action would you make to correct or to fix the economic troubles or the pains that Nigerians are feeling today? You see, the position of our party, NNPP, was very clear. Right from day one, we told the government that they should extend the date, make it open-ended. Now that they said they had to start it, no going back. Instead of opening it open-ended, what they did was to increase by 10 days. 10 days was very much inadequate. Now, look, in some states, in northern Nigeria today, you have people living over 200 kilometers away from any bank in this country. And you see, you are talking of people who have 10 million, 100 million, 1 billion. We are talking of people who are having 5,000, 3,000, somebody who is selling even sugar cane, one piece, which he cleaned and is cutting and selling. People who are doing little, little business to, to, to earn a living. Their capital is very small. Now, their capital cannot even convey them from where they are to any bank and come back home. And all these arrangements were not being done. So our concern, of course, is the poor, the telecowers of this country. And they are really suffering. Now, we, from MBS, they told us there are more than 133 million people who are living below poverty line. Now, the ones that well, are above... dimensionally poor. Those that are even above the line now, look at it. People, even Rawani was saying he didn't have cash. I don't have cash. I'm struggling to get cash to even sustain what I'm doing, my moves. So they said the so rich on. also cry. Because, you see, you see, the point is, the people that they thought mm. will suffer from this policy are the very people who own banks. So, Senator, what the would you do? What, what would you have do? state governments. Mm. Now, you go to state governments. Now, only God knows what is happening because they will summon all the bank managers, all the managing directors, and ask them to collect. In the you think that is what is happening? And you see, people are even worried. What is even happening in the National Assembly and so on? We are aware they invited the governor. And since then, we have not heard much from them. And people are making a lot of allegations. So, all these things... I can tell you, it is the poor, very poor, that is suffering. What would and you do to turn this around? Should you win the election? Now, should I win election is simple. And as we said, it is a party that we will allow each and every Nigerian with one naira to whatever number of naira you have legally to come and get your own new currency. Of course, the decision by the uh, Council of State to ensure that uh, we have more, ca more, more, more currency, uh, 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 more cash, is very important. But the problem is, whatever they have today, there are people who are looking for billions and billions, especially to finance this uh, election. Now, we are looking at the whole scenario as a party, that PDP and APC right. have got a lot of money. Mm. Not only that, they have governors who will do whatever they can do in their states to get money for them. They have uh, uh, many people who have banks, and some of them may even have banks themselves. Senator. And therefore, mm. all what we are saying is, this: uh, when we have an opportunity, mm -hmm. the first thing to do is, of course, we'll open it and ask people to bring in yeah. their money. Yeah, let's wrap up, and I have two quick questions. Do you think INS is ready for this election? from your own point standpoint? Well, I've been very busy doing my campaigns, 
Uh, I'm not sure if they are, I mean, I hope they are ready, but the fact remains that uh, we are very concerned about what they have done in Kano in 2019. And our prayer is this time around they should be upright and do the right thing. Mm. Now, the little hope that we have today is what they have done in Ekiti, in Ocean, and even in a number of states. And uh, that has given us a little bit of hope, plus the fact that, uh, of course, President signed the uh, electoral law. Now that we have, we have beavers, and that will help. Now we are keeping our eyes, mm. and we hope the INEC will do the right thing. So other stakeholders like the security agencies, yeah. we have seen a situation, especially in Kano, where we have seen the worst side of the uh, members of the police force and other security agencies. Senator. They went and connived with the mm. government uh, shamelessly, very crudely, mm. and uh, 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 declared the losers uh, winners and vice Senator, versa. Senator, we're totally out of time now, but in 20 seconds, if you may, more than almost 60 or more than 60 percent of the voting population are young people between the age of, 30, of 18 and 39. Do you see these people on your side? And if you, should you lose this election, what would you do? Would you try again? Now look, the young men and women have always been our strength. All along. To the extent that uh, when we are having more and more young men and women who are registering, we are very comfortable. You see, we have a very good policy in education. Free education from pri primary school, secondary to even tertiary mm -hmm. level. We sent over 3,000 young men and women abroad in four years. We established two universities in Kano. We sent our children to private universities in thousands in this country. We sent them to federal, government, federal uh, universities and so on. At the time I was living in Kano, there was nobody that we knew who had qualification to go to university or any tertiary institution that you could not get and who was not sponsored. So, uh. you see, we have been friendly to the young men and women. And I can and tell you, you think they will come true we for are you? the only people today <laughs> mm. that will start from one end of Nigeria to the other end of Nigeria right. and everybody is hailing us because they have seen people Senator. who are likely going to save them from the crisis that we have today in this country. Senator Rabi Kwankonsa is a presidential candidate of the NNPP and I wish you the very best in this race. Thank you so much indeed. For Thank coming. you. Thank I you. I appreciate sure. it. But that's our for show for today. I'll see you again on Sunday at 8 p.m. Bye-bye.